Our guest today, Nara Kupelian, is a practicing attorney in Southern California who comes from a family that were often labeled as Akbars while they lived in Soviet Armenia. Akbars, which is a play on the Western Armenian pronunciation for brother, Yakbar, was used as a type of sarcastic slur for many Western Armenians who repatriated in the mid-20th century to Eastern Armenia. Not his family, along with thousands of other Armenians who had returned to Soviet Armenia at the invitation of Stalin, were optimistic about starting their new life in the homeland after decades of living in exile. Unfortunately, the expectations did not match the reality, scars of which can be seen until this day in the Republic of Armenia and perhaps among our friends and our communities in the diaspora, who may have a story to tell, similar to the one you'll hear today. You are listening to High Tube Talks, the official podcast of the AYF West. I'm Haig Minasyan. And I'm Haro Bird. And we're just a couple of Armenians talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Welcome, Nada, to the show. I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> very excited. Um, and we've talked about this subject a lot over the years, and I've always wanted to get you in here to you know, learn more and yeah. uh, sh- even share the story. Uh, because I remember when I was in Armenia, uh, I'd speak Western Armenian, which is what comes naturally to me. And a lot of the older generation would often be like, you know, I understand completely well. You know, my mother spoke Western Armenian or I heard it in the house. And I would think like, OK, maybe their family came from uh, Western Armenia during the genocide or something. And then they would explain like, no, they came actually afterwards, you know, World War, after World War Two, the 40s, 50s, 60s. And I. I was like, that's impossible. I thought the borders were closed. I didn't think that was possible. And then later, or after I heard this, I started looking it up, and I did see that thousands of Armenians from the diaspora came to the Soviet Union, came to Soviet Armenia. So uh, if you could kind of break down this period and this uh, policy and uh, this historic event, let's say, timeline, you know? Yeah, so I think the... the the timeline that we're looking at is essentially starts in the late 30s and then culminates to maybe the 50s. Um, and in that span of time, there's so much, so many different things that happen that causes changes that that we're currently facing now. Um, in a very simplistic way, you have communities living outside of Armenia, um, uh, forced exile communities, most of them. And you have policies for different reasons. Uh, Things change in the Soviet Union that makes uh, Soviet officials want to look abroad to bring these people in. We can detail uh, those a little bit later. But like, you know, they want to grow the population, you know. They want to grow the population and there's political aspects to it, too. So at this time, you have um, you had a lot of there was a lot of interchange between the Soviet Union and Turkey. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet Union was trying to expand its territory a little bit. So they were trying to strong arm um, Turkey into um, seceding the um, uh, Western Armenia. Kars and Ardahan right, provinces, which they had given back to them like 20 years beforehand, exactly, right? Yeah. Exactly. So there was a proposal that would allow for the Soviet Union to take those territories back, but the only way that they can do this was to show that there was a robust population in Armenia of Armenians. And so they needed to populate Armenia. Um, what better way to do this than to go to the Middle East and to the United States and to Greece and um, even South America and try to bring home these people by um, making this uh, plea for nationalism and Mm. return to the homeland. But on the flip side, you also had very practical reasons. Um, Armenia kind of became a hub for industrialization at this time. And there were a lot of factories that were built and there weren't a lot of people to man these factories. Um, and they started to uh, go through with this repatriation program in order to bring workers yeah. into Armenia. And the third prong, which I found very interesting and I, I never knew about, was they wanted to bring resources in. So one of the main targets of uh, repatriation propaganda was the United States. The mm. old uh, Near Eastern Relief families that went to uh, the U.S. right after the genocide. 
um, these people had exposure to Western technologies and Western goods. Mm. And they figured that if they repatriate a lot of these families, they'll bring their Western technologies and their goods with them. So there was also a way to reap information by bringing in these um, Armenian families, which actually worked. There oh, were Okay, sense. so mm-hmm. what I'm trying to you know, comprehend here is how did they really get people to get over there? Like, how did they really enforce that policy of trying mm-hmm. to get people into Hayastan? Um, so the communities they targeted were people who were displaced from the genocide. So okay. you're talking maybe around 30 to 40 years after the genocide, less than that. Mm-hmm. Um, around that time, these are first generation, maybe second generation heading into the second generation. So these people are have a certain level of um, nationalism and, and, and pull to the cities that their parents came from. Um, and there is a plea to return to the homeland uh, for specifically for these people who always believed that there was a homeland to return to. Yeah. You have to understand that at this point, 20, 30 years in, the idea of Western Armenia isn't something that's just gone and foregone and like a lost pipe dream that one has. It could very happen it could like very tomorrow. Well, you yeah, know? yeah, it could very well be that we're, we are in the ebb and flow of history and things might change where um, the return to Western Armenia might be an ideal that people that might be something that could happen. Like we're just here temporarily. When I know. talk to my grandparents, my grandmother says that my parents would say, one day we're going to go back. So make your lives very temporary here. Mm-hmm. Make your lives temporary. Make it so that you can pack up and leave any minute. Because one day we're going to go back. We got this place. We have to live in here. But one day we're going to go back. And so when these, so these propagandists who uh, appealed to the people in those communities, they were they weren't idiots. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were very sophisticated, and they knew exactly what they were saying to these people. And it was on two prongs, uh, one of them being this this very sentimental pull to the homeland, and the second being fear-mongering. Um, mm. There was a fear-mongering there that um, if you don't move to back to Armenia, if you don't go to your homeland— um, the population is going to dwindle to a point where Stalin is going to allow Georgia is going to allow Georgia yeah. to annex it. Do you really want Georgia to annex your territory? And they're able to communicate that yeah. to the diaspora. So uh, um, my grandparents also said that they would come to the schools and they would tell um, people that you know um, if you have a short timeline, if you don't convince your parents that you want to go back to Hayastan, then. Um, it's going to be become a part of Georgia. We're going to lose Armenia. Yeah, we're so, going to lose Armenia. So they're really like tugging on their emotions. You they're know? tugging on their emotions and they're instilling fear. Mm. And an I emotive mean, fear. What's it's ironic, something. and I'm sure we'll talk about it in a little bit as well, but you know they're they're playing on the most maybe nationalists uh, of the diaspora in a in a union in a Soviet Union that's not very pro nationalists at all you know so they're like manipulating and tugging at them to come in um and then this is where we could see the problem kind of fester afterwards um but i mean like uh, what about the logistics like boats you know the pamphlets like how were they getting the news out were governments okay with this you know different places were operated in different ways um one of the first places that was targeted was um uh iraq And in Iraq, they work directly with the British government to institute um, a state-sponsored program encouraging people to repatriate. So the the first flow of uh, repatriates that you saw were from the cities of Mosul and Baghdad. And um, you had huge droves of people coming in because they would... Um, they they were promised um, not only a home and and jobs and things in Armenia, but the Iraqi government would um, also sponsor them to go. Uh, not the Iraqi government under the sponsorship of the British government would um, sponsor them to go. So it became a very lucrative thing for them. Yeah, the, like the, they're going to get rid of all the barriers and make this as mm-hmm. easy as possible for you guys yeah. to move over there. Yeah. Um, no, that's very interesting. I was wondering, Come. so that's the incentive, huh? Like when you get here also, you're going to have all this property and all this uh, these yeah. incentives. Yeah, so um, uh, from personal experience, my grandparents were told that if you move, you would receive a plot of land, you would receive a home, you mm-hmm. would have jobs, um, and you would be able to live in uh, your homeland without fear. And those things seem like great things to go back to. Um, but 
when you're talking about government involvement, there were also government that were governments that were vehemently against this. Um, the U.S. You, by chance? Uh, the, no. Not the U.S. Oh. Not, the U.S. not so much, but um, the South American Armenian communities. You saw ver- very little um, uh, repatriation back from mm. Argentina, Brazil, and um, uh, Uruguay because those governments uh, stood against uh, allowing. Um, their citizens to go back to the Soviet Union into something that was not a very sure situation. I also feel like those countries also wanted their populations. They were also trying True. to grow their populations mm-hmm. at the same time. But uh, how do your family was from Iraq? No, or some because you found out too that you have an Akbar family. <laughs> yeah, so you know, I always knew that my great grandma came from Iraq, but I never really thought of it in the way of like repatriation. You know, it was always like, oh, they're just going back to Hayastan because genocide, stay where you are, go back to Hayastan. That's the only way I've ever thought of it. And so when this topic came up about Akhbaz and Akhbar Utsun, my first instinct is like, let me go ask the people that were there. And then that's when, you know, you kind of realize that like, man, they they came over there, my family, my grandparents, they came from, great-grandparents came from Iraq to Hayastan, thinking in that same way you were saying of like, they were given a home, they were... Um, told they were going to have opportunities only to go there and see that there's nothing there. Was that something similar to your family? Absolutely. Um, what was the, what uh, happened? My, well, my grandparents, all all four of my grandparents, well, every ancestor I have was um, orphaned in genocide, ended up in actually the same area of Syria. It's a little village outside of Haleb called Afrin. Mm. Um, everybody ended up there. Um, a little shanty town that essentially became like a settlement and then um, actually was in the news a lot um, is, recently. Is that the same Afrin that's same that's Afrin, under yeah. Turkish control now? And it's the same Afrin. That's yeah. crazy. It's about an hour outside of Halib. Yeah. Um, but it became a, a refugee camp that turned into an Armenian kind of city Hub, at yeah. that time. Mm. And it was one of the areas that was heavily... Uh, uh, Targeted? under the control of these uh, propagandists who mm-hmm. came from the Soviet Union. Um, my grandparents built their lives there. They had a fairly comfortable lives, as comfortable as, you know, refugees and orphans could be. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, they had this idea of one day we're going to go back. Um, well, I wanted to say real fast is all along that northern Syria border were these Armenian towns, um, and they were all with the mindset that we're going to cross that border into Turkey one of these days. Yeah. So that's Afrin is right there, yeah, you know? And, and the idea, which I, I find very interesting, the idea was never to go back to Armenia. The idea, their idea was always to go back to Western Armenia. The towns that they actually yeah. came from. Before. We're going to go back to Sasun. We're going to go back to Marash. Like we are, they they had no connection to the territory of Armenia as we know it. They probably today. never been there anyway. They you had know? never been there. They had no connection to it. Um, and almost every doing this research, looking at these stories, I, I don't think I have come across a certain single family who had an idea that they're going to go to the territory of Armenia as mm-hmm. we know it today. It was always this Western Armenia that they wanted to go to. Nobody expected to ever go back to Eastern Armenia. And if, it, if they did, um, it was going to be a temporary situation. A, a stop on the mm-hmm. way to Western yeah. Armenia. So, so Yerevan was never on the mind. It was always like those outside places where they originally, you know, were kicked. You know, back home. They wanted back, to go back, back home. home. And was. home was not Yerevan. Home was... Western Armenia to and them. I'm, and I'm sure the propagandists were saying like, hey, look, we need to populate Eastern Armenia because, hey, the Soviets are going to come up with this plan to get back your Western Armenian land. So come, you know, it's part of the plan. Don't worry. you got to work uh, with us. Yeah. Big risks to take as the person making that move. <laughs> There's um, posters and pamphlets that you can see at the National Archives now that would probably influence me. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, it's so it's so poignant and so targeted and it's such... You know, it's targeted advertising to a refugee community, yeah. essentially. And it worked. Yeah. It really worked. Um, and, I mean, I want to say, like, kudos to all those families that made that move because their heart was in the right place, right? Like, the, uh, I mean, granted, uh, uh, it didn't work out for most, but uh, it still takes a lot of... And the numbers were so great that it yeah. was something that everybody was doing. It was a big deal, mm-hmm. You know, and uh, what I mean is, like, th- those who made that move were uh, uh, doing it for, you know, our nation, and that's, like, a very admirable thing, you know. Uh, the reality of what happened is another thing, you know. Yeah. 
So what I want to ask though is when when they first arrived, you mm-hmm. know, all the Akbars or just people that came into rape repatriation. Rep- repatriation. <laughs> fix that in post. <laughs> um, so when they first got there, you know, weren't they like together? And then did that, was it everybody was sent together into one town or one place? Or were they kind of all spread out, mixed in with different type of uh, groups? and and um, Yeah, how did that look? Yeah. You got your notice. You agreed to go. You were given an assignment, and people did not all go together. People mm. went in different waves. So mm. this ship left. They, they went on ships. I think so, I've seen those photos. They're pretty yeah, crazy. Yeah, so if you look, there's there's a lot of pictures you can find online that were originally in the archives of um, refugee, uh, not a refugee, re- repats coming on these boats. Um, like uh, cruise liners. It's like, like almost thing. a cruise liner. Yeah. And there's a big banner on there that says, Pari yeah, Welcome home. <laughs> um, that sounds lit. I'm but <laughs> yeah, but the irony probably... is that they're docking in Batum in yeah. Georgia. Mm. So um, they came in waves. And um, these, uh, if you agreed to go, you received your 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 pass essentially to the homeland Mm. and you boarded a ship and at that point um i want to use examples just to show you like what one family's like life was in making this journey like my grandmother says you know we we decided to go my father my brothers decided to go um we took everything we had and we uh packed it and in that included um like grains and things that we had coffee beans um, which was a very lucrative thing at that time. Um, we packed everything, and it was a journey. We got to Batum, um, and that's when the difficulty started right from the shore. They take everything or something? They took everything. They confiscated. Mm-hmm. She's like, I distinctly remember the Soviet authorities um, slashing open our bags of grain and dumping it into the harbor. Wow. Um, you can't bring these things with you. Um, you get an assignment. She goes, most of the people thought that they were give, being given homes that were habitable. She said that her family was given uh, like a mud hut, essentially. Mm. Not habitable, cold, and they were not in Yerevan. They were not near any cities. My my grandmother, on my maternal side, they, were, they went to a... Um, it's a village outside of uh, Vanadzor, Darbas, Mm. which was so high up in the mountains and at that point uninhabitable because it was so cold, especially in a mud hut. So um, you were given this plot of land, but because it was uninhabitable, you couldn't really live there. So what they ended up doing was packing their stuff again and moving to Yerevan and ending up having to buy a home themselves because they rejected what the government gave them, even though what the government gave them was horrendous. So it's interesting that you say that because my grandpa actually brought up this kind of like the way they kind of got it going. They had their spot in the Gul, mm-hmm. but at the time there wasn't any jobs. And then the jobs that they had, they would have to walk an hour or two to work in just cotton fields, which was the only thing that was really accessible to them at the time, was is what he's telling me. And so my great-grandfather would go all the way to Yerevan to just find some work. And at the time, you know, he wasn't getting paid, like, dollars or anything like that. Sometimes he was just getting paid in, like, you, you know, just getting paid in butter or different type of things like that. <laughs> yeah. Food, yeah. And then yeah. when he got to Yerevan, at first they kind of questioned him because they're like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be in your gyul taking care of your cows and, and pigs and stuff. Why are you here in Yerevan? And so they detained him and had to question him a bunch. Later, kind of let him still work in Yerevan. But this is a reality that people had to go to. They just came to Hayastan just to... You know, recreate not just their lives, but the economy and the world around them. Yeah, and they just made it harder. It was a series of, as my grandma would say, betrayal after betrayal after betrayal. And one of them being worse than the last. And I think one of the things that she said that was most hurtful was she said most of the time you didn't expect these betrayals from people who were supposed to be your countrymen. Your, your countrymen. That's honestly the saddest part, if you ask yeah. me about this. Um, well, so your family story, your family's experience, this is obviously what, you know, got you interested in this subject and your research. Uh, I know you research this, but in university, what did you focus on specifically? Was it kind of examples of what we're talking about now? I, I grew up with this, um, but I was, I didn't make sense of it for most of my life. Um, 
it was, uh, you know, most people know where their family comes from, and it's a very clean, straight line. But I didn't understand the different dichotomies that existed in my life. Like, my grandmother spoke Russian, but she also spoke Turkish. Um, they, she spoke, she said certain Russian words with a Western Armenian tinge to it. Um, they went to Siberia for a certain period of time. I had no idea why. Um, my fa- I, I always felt like my family had one foot in the West and one foot in the East. I'm just thinking I, about you, Nade, like yeah. hearing like, we were in Syria and desert, and then we were in the Siberian. Yeah, like, like, how'd you get from there to there? You, <laughs> were, you, were, you were orphans of the genocide, and then you got exiled. Like, mm-hmm. and, and I was very fortunate in my childhood to, be, um, to grow up with my grandma. Um, and all, my grandparents were there when I was being raised, and um, I kind of became a microcosm of all of their stories, mm. and they festered, and they had questions. Um, I remember my grandma, my dad's mom, would always um, take me to hang out with her friends and play bingo. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, whenever it was like summer vacation, I would just she would babysit me, and we would hang out. And I remember these people specifically because some of them were people that she knew from. Back then. The camps yeah. in Siberia. And they would talk about these issues. Um, they would talk about secret prison languages and things you weren't saying. And, I'm, and I, I, for a long time in my childhood, thought these were um, stories. And yeah. they were so interesting. And so when I had the opportunity, I decided I need to make sense of this. And part of the, the one time that I realized that there has to be more here is when I went to Armenia for the first time and I didn't experience a culture shock, which I expected to experience. It all felt very home. It all felt very familiar, comfortable, familiar, yeah. familiar and comfortable, but also it felt different at the same time. Mm-hmm. And um, I started to do a lot of research and uh, through school programs, the university, grad school, I went to, um, I did a bunch of work at the archives to dig into what was available because Mm -hmm. these archives are also, they're so full of information and stories, but they're not being utilized. So it was an eye-opening experience to try to make academic sense of stories of my childhood that that just had had sat there for a really long time and it's the the mo- strangest thing when you learn about something academically and then you realize that you know about this from a story in your childhood yeah. um yeah but but that was that was the seed essentially and i spiraled that into something a little bit bigger because i started to ask more questions um you for have, example, you have. I started. I think of this on a three tier sort of way. Um, you have uh, a certain identity that develops in um, your your first exiled home, your genocide refugee community, mm-hmm. and then you have that ideological shift, that paradigm shift that happens with going home, but feeling like you're not really home. Mm-hmm. And not to mention there's other nuances like exile and repression and all of these mm-hmm. things. And then after that, you have return. So you, you have repa- refugee life and then you have repatriation and then you have return. Mm-hmm. And I think about these things specifically on a three-level prong. How does that ideological shift happen? And had, how, what can we learn from it? Because I see so many of our issues now um, – Things that shouldn't be issues because we already have the answers to these right. specific things. No, that's kind of the hope of this entire, episode. You is, had an entire community who lived this experience. And and sadly, it's 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 kind of been swept under the rug. We don't learn. And I have to say, most people, I mean, I didn't know about this till very recently. Yeah, know? I mean, I thought I knew. I, first, I think I know everything. <laughs> you know, but you do, bro. When I heard this, I, I was shocked that i didn't even hear about it and then when i mentioned it in my family they were kind of shocked that i would even ask about this because to them this was like a childhood issue and all of a sudden three thousand miles 50 years later you know i'm coming in here asking like yo were you ever called an akhbar yeah and then it's like a whole different um like way of looking at it now and looking at your family history and kind of what they went through i had never in my million years would have imagined that my grandpa who i've always thought of like the most hardcore 
Hayastansi, uh, Stansi, Stansi, Stansi Yerevansi, yeah. like that. I've never really kind of thought about it in that way, even though I knew that they came from, you know, mm-hmm. Iraq. Like I knew that they came from there, but I never put that thing together of like what they actually had to go through when they got there. And what I think is interesting is a lot of our friends like Nada and you, uh, you know, have this dichotomy like you mentioned, you know, to maybe the Western Armenian diasporans. Now you seem very Eastern Armenian, but then to Eastern Armenians, you know, you seem Western Armenian and you're kind of in this in-between world, which I find interesting. And I think that's what, you know, maybe what you're kind of looking into with your research, right? And I struggled uh, with it a lot growing up yeah. and in my teenage and college years, too. But it took a very long time for me to kind of um, understand that that is probably the coolest thing yeah, that I have. Beautiful. It is because I, I there is not a community that I don't feel at home with, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's Armenian um, all star. Yeah. Ar- yeah. That's the both worlds. Right? Um, and it, it really is an interesting thing. And um, one thing that I that kind of made me dive into this understanding the the ideological and the identity change to it was. My grandmother, the one that I said mm-hmm. um, I spent my childhood with, when she passed away, she had left behind this poem that nobody knew about. Um, she had written it. Um, when she passed away, and amongst her things, we found this one poem that she wrote. And the last four lines of it, um, she wrote, I have a secret that is even hidden from God, and I wish for my kids to be raised under the Armenian flag. Wow. Which to somebody who had probably, I would say, went through more suffering in Armenia than anybody else, mm-hmm. um, that is a big thing to say. Yeah. Um, somebody who toiled in Siberia and then didn't have a very easy life coming back. Even after everything. How does that person still have that very secretive dream that her kids and her grandkids be raised under the Armenian flag. To still go back. You know, and honestly, it, it's possible that if there was another opportunity to do something like that, you know, your grandma would still be like, you know, we're going to take this risk again. Who knows? So, the way of- I'm looking at it kind of is like she she probably deep down kind of understood that maybe it's not Hayastan's fault per mm-hmm. se. And then going back to the like the main issue of like the Soviet policy. And so maybe, you know, she kind of understood or... Yeah. Do you think it was more something else? Yeah, like policy is policy. But I think what's interesting here is what policy does to people. Yeah. Because the people didn't end up on those exile lists because of the policy. The people ended up on those exile lists because there were Armenian countrymen who believed in those lists and called to complain about certain neighbors of theirs to be mm. placed on those exile lists. Policy could be dictated from the top down. But it's when people buy into it, that's when you have a cultural phenomenon. So I I think there was a deep pain there from feeling neglected by your own by your own people. Yeah, essentially. I mean, good people will still take advantage of you. And uh, that's what it seems like is a lot of neighbors were taking advantage of this loophole in the system where they can abuse this power, this policy that the Soviets have kind of put forward. I would be interested in hearing some examples of situations where, um, you know, someone would be sent to the gulag. You know, what would get you in trouble in this situation? It ranged, it ranged from something as simple as dropping a picture of Stalin that you were trying to put up at your workplace Oh, my God. Yeah. All the way to a kid s- singing a song in preschool. Um, we know of families that have gotten um, exiled because a kid a kid went to preschool and sang Zartir Vortiag. Yeah. And that was a nationalistic song. Yeah. Um, wearing a cross. Um, uh, up to more serious things like attending uh, meetings of political parties, mm. uh, being taken taking pictures under political flags of certain political parties, um, going to secretive meetings. Um, if they found a red, blue, and orange in your house, you're done. Or like, something. Uh, or something. It's sometimes it's just not anything at all. Sometimes it's that so and so has a house that I like, and they're not willing to sell it to me. So I'm going to complain about them. They're going to go to the gulag yeah. tomorrow. Um, or in other situations, there might be a girl who somebody liked right. and the girl yeah. is not um, accepting their marriage proposal. So there you go. They'll send the entire family but the girl. 
Or like the, they're married and they want to get rid of the husband and then get rid of the husband or something. <laughs> it, it, my point here is that it could have ranged from something as serious as going completely violating Soviet law all the way to just pissing somebody off. Yeah. And I think it's kind of – it might be hard for some people to even kind of grasp that idea that your fellow Armenian neighbor is going to you know, essentially either make something up or kind of tell on you – into costing your life or yeah, even your, your life. family's life at yeah. that. Um, my grandparents were exiled um, because her older brother, so there were se- several reasons, but um, her older brother was um, uh, on a list of people to have attended a meeting mm-hmm. of the ARF yeah. at that time. Um, their official deportation notice says, Tashnak um, Tsagan, which at that time didn't mean a member of the political party. It just meant nationalist. Yeah. Um, and they exiled every person in the family except for my grandmother and her younger and her second to youngest brother. They orphaned. In a sense. Um, like, we're not orphaned, but you know, like not where do they orphaned, go? but where do you yeah, go? Yeah. You know. So um, her mother was blind, so she ended up going with the family. Mm-hmm. They were placed on a um, cattle cars, essentially, not even a train. Cattle cars. And not being told where they're going, um, not being told that they're going to the middle of a taiga, essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, several hours, not hours, days later, um, the cattle car stops and they're in Altaisky province in the middle of Siberia Mm -hmm. um, in a city called Bernau and on the border of like Uzbekistan, no man's land, basically no man's land. Dumped in the middle of nowhere, um, given timber logs, you have to build your own house, and then you toil the fields. Every day you check in, every day you check out. You well, get one potato. What was the sentence at like a certain amount of years or lifetime usually? How about in your families? Uh, so there were, there, were, there were different tiers. So this right. camp was not considered prison. It was considered relocation. Oh. It means that you were problematic where you were. So you needed to be relocated, but you can still live in freedom. You just have to work these specific fields and you have to work in this very inhospitable area. And you can't leave. And you can't leave. Well, you could try, but you really can't. Yeah, you really can't. Because you're in the middle of a nowhere. You're going to die trying to leave. Yeah. Um, If you messed up at those prisons, uh, at those camps, you ended up being um, arrested there. And if you were arrested, it was a minimum 25-year sentence. Damn. Um. And sometimes those things were arbitrary. Um, my yeah. grandmother tells the story of um, how when she was pregnant with m- her, her my, my aunt, essentially, she, uh, they were working in a field and there was a, a plane that flew by and one of her neighbors turned around and said, eh, Lusadzin, I wish one day one of those planes might take us home. No. Somebody heard that, oh, and that man was taken into questioning. And that they, alone, <laughs> and they brought my my grandmother in as a witness for her to affirm that he said that, and she wouldn't. And so they beat a seven month pregnant woman to a pulp, but she still wouldn't say it that this man, you know, essentially said that's that certain statement. Just saying, I wish I can go home. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. uh, When do you think? um, I just want to kind of get an understanding of the timeline. So, when was it? When did it first start? When was it the most aggressive? And when did it end? Was this a Stalin era thing? Or it was. It started in around like late 1930s. Late, but at that time it was mainly intelligentsia, um, clergy. Um, people who actually there was actually a process to it. You had to have committed some sort of crime you had to have some sort of reason and you had to go through a trial procedure before you were exiled so at that those years it was mainly um intelligentsia and clergy and officials and political leaders who were being exiled towards the 40s whenever you had this repatriation movement 46 to 49 um june of 49 was one of the uh it, they call it like black tuesday it was where 12,000 people were exiled in one day. So one Armenians. day. Armenians. 12,000 yeah. a day. Wow. So um, 
you essentially, it went from being very targeted to specific officials in, around the late 1930s up to being a very arbitrary procedure. If you basically, you had a complaint against you, if I were to call the NKVD and say, you know, I heard Haig singing um, Kinilitz or whatever yeah. at that time, and uh, you would be on a train the next day. How could they prove that? There I was, was seeing no that song. <laughs> <laughs> How could they know? <laughs> it was, I am, I am a Soviet citizen and I am affirming that, so it's a signed writing, you have to say. Um, there's a great documentary where people talk about, there was, was kind of like this very petty movement that people would go to the funerals of the people who ratted them out. I think it's crazy that and, like these people still were living around them afterwards. And, right? and you know? that's my third question when mm -hmm. I mentioned the three prongs, the return. How do you return? And some people return to live right next to the people who sent them there in the first place. You know, my grandparents returned to the home where they knew that their oh neighbor God. ratted them out yeah. for no particular reason whatsoever. Um, and it, it, it's that return that that was most painful to people. I, um, my grandmother would always tell us the story about how their house – before Ahmad Hayas' son went up the statue, it was Stalin. Mm -hmm. um, and when they moved back, uh, Stalin had died, but the statue was still there. So, um, and their house that they were given after they came back was in Monument, right behind the statue. So that statue, Stalin's statue, would block all light into the apartment. So there was no light coming in. And symbolic. her mother would, her mother-in-law would wake up every day and say, you know, we're never going to have any light. We're never going to have any relief. This, this statue is just always going to be there. And she very poetically described the day that they woke up. And so the Stalin statue was taken down because there was such a vast, like, protest movement against taking the statue down. It was toppled in the middle of the night. They took it down in the middle of the night without anybody knowing. So my uh, grandma describes this moment of her, them waking up in the morning and drawing the curtains and this incredible light just floods wow. the room. And she's like, that woman, the only thing she could do was just dance. Yeah, that's <laughs> She insane. just broke out into a dance because um, there was finally light coming. And I, I, I can't think of any more poetic way of yeah, it's describing the movie scene, it. You know? it's I'm sure so Ararat popped out too and everything. <laughs> yeah, like, everything. That just gives me goosebumps <laughs> listening to something yeah. like that. So it, it's that return. You, know, you, you, you spent so many years of your life uh, toiling in a place where you don't even know. You probably think you're going to die there. And then you come back to have to live behind the shadows of the guy who put you there in the first place. And um, well, that leads me to my next question is, uh, was it, like, let's say they returned. Was it taboo to talk about this, even bring it up with that yeah. neighbor that ever, you know, brought it yeah. up or did that to them? Yeah, you can't talk Look, about it. Look, it's taboo to talk about it to this day. Yeah. It's taboo to talk about it. When you have uh, exhibitions in Armenia being canceled uh, because this is too controversial of a topic to be talked about, you have um, – people trying to erect statues of leaders who um, had a great hand to play in mm -hmm. this, uh, in, the, in the Great Terror yeah. itself. You, it's a taboo topic to talk about to this day. Um, my aunt um, uh, would always talk about how she, she did a PhD in linguistics um, in Armenia. And throughout the entire duration of her education, she was discriminated against because she was the child of um, uh, an Akbar. Akbar Chutik. But they even <laughs> but they would even call them anvastaheli um, ans, like untrustworthy people. This and that. So she was singled out in class. Um, she was singled out when receiving her degree. She was singled out um, when uh, she had to present her thesis and she says that this this took a toil on her entire education this is when like 80s 70s this, or 90s this is 70s yeah so it, it dragged on until then i remember going to armenia and my dad had to go to extra questioning and me and my mom would leave the airport and and sit out and wait for my dad because my dad's parents still had that on their record. So my dad still had that on his this, record. This is being, Republic of Armenia, though? Yes, this, because the Republic of Armenia inherited 
the KGB's but, criminal records. But that doesn't make sense since it's not the same government or, you know. It's it, not, it, but they inherited the records. Yeah. So when you go off of the record keeping, when they punch in my dad's name, it shows that his parents were arrested in Siberia. But under, like, policies that make no sense in the Republic of Armenia, like, you think Does they'd it? maybe go through it. And, I mean, maybe they yeah. Well, yeah, um, but it still subjects you to a questioning. Questioning, yeah. And that's, in and of itself, that's a, that's a problem. Yeah, it's discriminatory. You know. When so, when I did my birthright in um, birthright Armenia in Gyumri, oh yeah, I it was the first time that I got called. I was called an Akbar, um, but which they, they knew. Or they they, it was they, by they didn't know. They didn't know. And um, and so I was telling somebody. I was introducing myself to the guy I was working for, and he very, in a very like sarcastic tone. He goes, "Ha, huh, Akbaris!" Like in this very like. Yeah. weird tone um, and it wasn't until I, up until that point in my life I knew that we were Akbar but I didn't know that there was drama over it mm-hmm. I didn't know that it, it meant certain things so that was one of the points where I was like huh why did he give me that look why did he have that look and um, lo and behold there's there is this great conflict that still exists to this day. And it's it's a cultural shift. Look, people who have lived in the Middle East for 30, 40 years obviously have different customs. And that has translated itself to different ways that things are done in the Republic of Armenia. Um, for example, when I was doing my interviews, um, one thing that I found out was the people wouldn't hang out in people's apartments in the Soviet Union. It was not something that was done. You don't go over to somebody's house for surj. If you have to go over to somebody's house for surj, you have something to talk about. And the walls have ears. There are propaganda posters that literally say the, the walls have ears. <laughs> so if you were to come to my house for surj, that would be a very um, controversial thing. And people would it would give suspicious, reason for whatever. people to be suspicious of you. So that's why the, the, the bug was created. The courtyard space. Ah, everyone Cause, sees cause you. Everyone <laughs> sees you. So instead of going and hanging out in a you know, certain person's apartment and drinking coffee and having people raise an eyebrow, you would just coalesce in these courtyard areas. So the Bach is a Soviet rendering yeah. of a hangout space. We're out in the open. We have nothing to hide. We're out in the open, and I can, in the people can eavesdrop on you. And if you're saying things that you shouldn't be saying, there's somebody listening. Yeah, which is definitely in Hayastan right now. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, but like. but in but in Armenia, <laughs> that buck is to this day is yeah. a huge thing. There is an entire like satirical comedy series Damn. called Med Bak. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a bar called Bak Sunday. Exactly, exactly. So, Man, but that that thing. came out as a way of uh, people. Um, uh, having a safe, the the government instituting a safe way for people to hang out. Yeah. Um, but there's deep cultural differences that occur between people. It's not necessarily the Soviet told them to hate the people, repats coming in. Right. It was that people did not understand each other. Yeah. And they had different customs and they had different um, ideals and they had different ways of living. Um, when you go around Yerevan now, you will see different communities that were formed. Well, Marash, Zeytun, um, Malatya, those were all named after Western Armenian cities by repats who moved there and decided to call it after the city that they came from in Western Armenia. I always thought that. I, I, that was my guess the whole time. That they, yeah. Especially after learning about this repatriation, I was like, I bet mm-hmm. these neighborhoods were based off of people that were from Zeytun or Marash, which I think is cool in its own way of just keeping those names alive. But... Uh, they turned the outskirts of Yerevan into their own little Western Armenia. Yeah, so there's when, even one called Akhbarashen. Oh wow! <laughs> I was asking my my grandfather like I'm like when you were older was this still something? Because they're from Zaytun, like yeah. they're my, they everybody stayed in Zaytun. So I asked like when you got older were people still like kind of like giving you a prom for being an Akhbar or calling you an Akhbar? And he basically described to me like. Everybody around me was Akbar, so no one's going to be saying anything to me because we're all just living with each other now. Yeah. One of the most, um, I, I looked at this in reverse when I was doing my research. I wanted to see how, not necessarily how Akbars changed their lives going in. I wanted to see how Degati's life changed by having others come in. So, and um, what happened to the people who were there in the first place? Mm-hmm. And they had this these foreign people coming in and influencing their lives. And it was very interesting that a lot of people would um, uh, point to food 
and drink as as the most um uh, as the parts of their lives that were affected the most um almost um the majority of people i said said that coffee was introduced to them for the first time um after the akhbars came in the food changed they started to eat things in a different way um but it was it was so that surji culture came with like of these, course yeah and i bet there's so many other contributions to that came with the repatriation music you know, and, and art and and craftsmanship I don't even of know. course craftsmanship but i found it particular that most of these people didn't say anything about them being untrustworthy so it all boils down to when somebody acts and eats and drinks in a different way than you do it's grounds for suspicion yeah. and when the government is already imposing this one idea on upon you you also start to believe it and you start to see the worst in people was it a little bit of a jealousy thing you think they're seeing some people come in with a little bit you know lack of a better term flavor coming in with some flavor you think there was a little bit of a jealous aspect to it mm-hmm. or a misunderstanding mm-hmm. jealousy or i believe i think it's just fear of the other mm-hmm. yeah fear of the other and and look it happens to this day i i go to i I've, I've looked at i've i've met and seen people um now in Yerevan who are still who have this who still have the same sentiment amongst uh regarding the um no. recent uh, refugees from the Syria, uh, Syrian Lebanon. war mm-hmm. yeah or the Lebanese um it, you know repats and do you think because they see like you know off the bat they feel kind of like they're the other they don't have that same sympathy as if something was to happen to these Akbars in Armenia they don't feel as bad about it because they there's this like separate this uh you know they're not identifying as we're all the same type of Armenian at this point that's what it's sounding like yeah uh, uh yeah and the, and the Soviet Union was was kind of a, a created a space where people were all in it it completely encapsulated your entire life your work was for the state your entertainment was from the state you went to school for the state you did everything for the state so when you had people come into your life that you didn't understand they might be an enemy to the state and people got a lot from the soviet union too their houses were given to them their jobs were given to them most of the people who grew up in the so- in soviet armenia and had good lives still they lived through the golden years of the Soviet Union. Right. You know, they, they were loyal ha- to the state. They, they had, didn't have to struggle yeah. with a lot of the things that people struggle with now, like jobs. Everyone has a job. Everyone had little Education or more. And this and that. Everyone had opportunity and everyone had something that they could work with. Mm-hmm. Rather than now when it's uh, not even a meritocracy, you know. So, um when when people felt like their mode of life was just going to be usurped, that's when that's when you um uh it it drove people to to do very questionable things amongst other people but i um i also think that there wasn't necessarily an organized scheme to all this it was a very arbitrary and very random yeah. <laughs> um pinpointing of of and targeting of people yeah there's um, going to be those bad actors in every society and they took advantage of it's what tragic they, yeah it's tragic it's tragic because it when it's it affects people's lives to Right. I mean, when I think about, I'm pretty far withdrawn from it, but there were so many parts of my childhood where I felt that. Um, I remember we went to Mammoth for winter, like holidays once. My grandmother could not get out of the car because she could not walk on snow. Damn. Because it reminded her of Siberia. Oh my god. Um. So it's 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 things like that. It's it's little aspects like that that. You, I, I knew about this story, but I never knew the context of it. I never knew the, the understood the, you know, um, why it was like that. Well, one of my friends actually, you know, was telling me, and this is like a minor case of how, not minor case, but her great grandmother was sent to the Gulag, the, to Siberia, and because of that, her grandmother. Uh, didn't grow up with a mother at home. Mm-hmm. And this transferred throughout the generations where now, like for three generations now, they've had kind of like rough mother-daughter kind of experience, whatever, like relationships. Because at one point, a, a great-grandmother was taken out of that world, taken out of their life, and uh, it's had a residual 
what is it the intergenerational effect right up until this today and that's just one yeah. absent character absent person from the family i mean imagine something way more horrendous like the genocide or you know uh, uh, other events and how this still affects today so that is what i'm interested in is like uh you know how is this still affecting our communities today whether it's in the diaspora in armenia you mentioned that it's still pretty taboo they took down an event that was talking about this um they might still like kind of use akbar as a slur uh correct uh, to, to piss someone off or like you know to kind of make fun of somebody um i mean how could you give us an example of uh in the diaspora maybe how uh this has affected you or your family or what you've seen you about it? i i mean how it's affected me is i i feel like me and peers of mine who have come to terms with this have finally learned to own it and and to to appreciate it and to and to love it. Um, Do you guys find each other kind of? We thing? find each other. Yeah. I'm Offbot and I am proud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we really find each other because it's it's <laughs> it's, it's it's such a I can't even explain. It's it's literally like having one foot in the east and one foot in the west. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, it was uh, like the food is a complete mix and. There is so much that uh, that can be learned from the Armenian experience today. Um, like in the community organizations that we're in now is um, repatriation. And Tebi Yadgit is a huge, huge aspect. But we have an entire community who learned to do this. Yeah, went through it. Who went through it. And we have lessons to learn from it. Um, and I, 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 what I see in the Spurk now is a lot of people in my generation are learning to own this. And to come to terms with it, because this was not this was not like this in in, in prior generations. Um, my grandparents were very um, they 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 spent time in the gulags. My grandparents were Western Armenians who toiled and had very rough lives in the Soviet Union. And then there was my father who had a great life in the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. served in the Soviet military, and was extremely proud of that, mm-hmm. and still longs for those days. <laughs> And then you have me that grew up in the West and has a very skeptical view of all of this. And is I feel like this is the generation where we're kind of able to see it on a very neutral ground and to understand just exactly what happened here and what's being ignored. Mm-hmm. And when you dig deep, so part of a big part of my research was sitting down with families from Akhbarashin, Arish, Zaytun, mm-hmm. Malatya, all these places, and to understand just exactly what effect happened, what, what changed in their lives um, after they came back, um, after this whole thing ended. And, and the stories that you have is, is uh, have are kind of all over the place, and I don't, I don't know if we have a lot of time to detail a lot of these, mm-hmm. but... Um, they're fascinating, and, and you know, it's it's very hard for me to thematically say that this was the common experience because it's not. Yeah. You have people who come from um, repat families who ended up being officials in the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, uh, could you give us some resources where people could learn more about this stuff? Hayrenadarts.org. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, fa- it's an initiative of the Gulbenkian Foundation. Um, it is... Um, if you don't know if you're an Akbar, you can di- you can yeah. discover because you can pop your last name into a database and see what ship you came to Batum on. I'm actually really curious about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they it- took the entire ship dockets from the um, from the Pabeda, which was the, the the main boat that took Armenians back and forth from the Middle East or anywhere else to um, to Batum, and they. Put those in a database online where you can enter a last name in and you can um, find out when, where, from where. Mm-hmm. Sometimes even it's as detailed as what they brought with them. Um, but what I find, having been through those, having used that database a lot, you have to try multiple different spellings because mm-hmm. these are uh, most of the time people who speak Russian and use the Cyrillic alphabet trying to write Russian last uh, Armenian last names and then retranslated into the Latin like alphabet like Harutunian you know. would be Arutunian right um, and you have to um, try to figure, try to figure out so most of the last names are written completely different ways mm-hmm. and then for those there was a huge mass mass uh, like a large amount of people who came from Iran as well during mm-hmm. those years so those are land routes so those those um 
uh, lists are also available. But if you don't know if you're an Akhbar and if you yeah. don't know where your family was in 46, you can pop your last name into hadnadarts.org and find out. I'm on, I'm on the website right now and they have some numbers on like uh, who came. Yeah. Um, uh, according to the website, uh, rough estimates, 300,000, 450,000 in over 10 countries expressed a desire to relocate. In 1946, uh, Armenia accepted 50,000 individuals from six countries, Syria, Lebanon, Bulgaria, Iran, Romania, Greece. 1947, 35,000 individuals, same countries. 1948, 3,000. And then here it's saying in the U.S., like 160 came later on. So like even just within the 40s, that's almost 100K, you know, which is a pretty big number. Yeah. Um, and then uh, is there any other resources? Uh, I think there's a really good film. Yeah, right. the, um, the Paskevijian family, I think they were repats from Iran. They have a good two-part um, uh, two uh, documentary. Um, it's on Vimeo. Um, it's called Enemy of the People. Mm -hmm. And it's all about um, how repatriation and the great terror affected Armenians. And you can hear uh, a lot of firsthand accounts of families who were affected. It's a great resource. Um, those, there's, this has become a very hot topic in Armenia in recent years. Um, and there are certain groups that are, um, I mean, just looking at the archives, there's a lot of researchers working on different aspects of this issue. But there's certain several documentaries being made, and there's exhibits that are uh, being put together, um, Eclipse being one of them. That's the one that was canceled. Um, but on this website, harunadarts.org, this is meant to be the Museum of Armenian Repatriation. And um, you can find either links to the videos. You can find either the, um, there's a lot of art exhibits, photo exhibits. If you're interested in seeing some of the photos from the boats and um, photos from um, different um uh, like communities in Armenia, the repat communities in Armenia, it's, it's a great resource for anything you could find. What was the reasoning for them shutting down the Eclipse Gallery or whatever it was that do you I remember? believe the Ministry of Culture said that it's a controversial issue and that it was it being hosted in the Tumanyan Museum was improper. Uh, the Tumanyan Museum is supposed to be an, a place of art and, and literature, yeah. um, except that Hovhannes Tumanyan had three sons, f four sons who were killed yeah. in the Great Terror. But so. it's, 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 art and literature is innately like political and I mean, how, treated how like much, it's the Soviet Union. <laughs> how, so many of our artists, um, Yerisha Charens, Axel Bakuns, were killed in camps. Yeah. So how can we... Um, how could we completely shut off culture when culture was one of the main things that was repressed yeah. by the Great Terror? Exactly. So, um, <laughs> and I think I, I think there is the drama in this exists because there's a there's a lot of Armenians who were complicit in it. Yeah, I mean, descendants of, of those, you know, one of n n officials, um, uh, one of the main, uh, a high level Soviet official, um, Anastas Mikoyan, who himself being an Armenian. Um, signed NKVD lists of people to be exiled. He's like the we, Lavrov of his time. We don't want to come to terms with our involvement in it. Yeah. We don't want to come to terms that we could have done this to each other yeah. or that we didn't step up, except I I always go back and forth amongst all of this. Like, Mikoyan to me is a very conflicting f figure because he is, uh, on one hand, people say that you know he, he rehabilitated his image after the death of Stalin, and that he was being tested by Stalin by being uh, forced to you know. Are you loyal? Are you loyal, yeah. sirs? But yet again, he still did it. Yeah. Um, and that's a very tough pill for me to swallow. And I think the re rehabilitation of his image afterwards was a little far too little, far too late. Yeah. Um, Particularly of somebody of his own stature and his own and his own reputation, um, so I I think that the drama today exists because we have a very hard time coming to terms with our um, involvement in all of this yeah. and how we could have done this to our very own people. But on on different grounds too, it's it's also no longer this very painful, dramatic. Like I don't think "akhbar" is a dirty word now to use in Yerevan. Um, people have taken ownership of it. When I was I was in Yerevan um, 
last week. <laughs> yeah, you just got <laughs> and, back. <laughs> yeah, um, and when I was in Yerevan, I walked into a store called Haleb. My mom was with me, and we walked into a store called Haleb, and we had a Haleb tea woman who recently moved to um, uh, to our to Armenia. We were trying to buy ful, but they had the dry kind. And she was trying to tell us how to cook the fool. And my mom's like, I know. And um, and she said, oh, hina <laughs> So I'm like, <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> oh, so, so now there is this whole new phenomenon of hin yev nor So yeah. she said, oh, hina achbarek, menk nor So I'm like, wow. okay. So there is a, so I guess we're owning it. We're and now we're, it. now yeah. we're stratifying. Cool. Ooh, now we're going to be um, cool to be achbar. Now we're going to be the yeah. best. Yeah. Uh, look, it it is what it is, and I I think that um, a lot of my friends that I've met here who are Akbars have um, such great stories to tell about how they've um, blended their identities yeah. a lot. Um, you know, they've they've come to terms with mixing certain uh, the way they speak, the way they they interact with their friends. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing because it shows a very um, successful blending of your cultures. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I, I personally, in my experience, I don't understand until my adult life. Yeah. I don't understand the, the beauty of it until my adult life. And I think that's why it's so important that we came here and talked today and kind of went through this because I think there's going to be so many people. And to all the listeners out there, after this podcast, <clears throat> after this podcast, I want you guys to go down, talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, talk to whoever you need to because that's another resource of you learning about not just your history, but like sort of like the history of Armenia post genocide and post kind of the Soviet era, at least the beginning part of it. And that like, how do you might find out, you know, a whole story here of, you know, your family repatriating or, you know, having uh, been connected to a story like this, which is really fascinating. Just our narrative writing in Armenian families is, is so valuable. And um, of all, maybe like the hundreds of families that I've spoken to regarding this topic, I've, I'm have i still getting emails or like in the mail, I'll get pamphlets and booklets of those repats or those people who have written their family memoirs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's a great thing to, to, to have because it's, and they're mostly older, um, older people who, who feel like they, they need to just really tell their story mm-hmm. um, whether it's uh, being a repat whether it's being what they went through when they got to Yerevan um, a lot of people when they got here borders were sealed and they were stuck mm-hmm. and they had family that they needed to somehow tell to stay away my grandmother got here but her two older sisters stayed back in Haleb Mm. And she needed to tell them to not come. You mean to Armenia? Uh, yeah, to, Armenia. They came to Armenia, but her two older sisters stayed in Haleb. In Haleb. They were married, so they stayed with their husbands. But the plan was for them to pick up and come follow them after. Um, uh, and so they needed some way. And all mail, all outgoing mail was checked, completely yeah. checked. So you yeah. needed to find a way to encode, tell people to not come. So... She knew that her older sister hated potatoes, so she wrote, you know, if, if you want to eat potatoes all day long, we have, a lot of potatoes we have so many potatoes, this country is just full of potatoes, mm-hmm. just come here, we're going to have all sorts of, and her sister got the hint, and that yeah. family's still living in Halab. That's crazy. Um, but uh, other people would say, um, I know of uh, this one man who got very clever, and he needed to tell his parents to not come here, he had come with his uncle, who had died. They arrived in Armenia and the uncle died immediately, right then and there. And so he needed to tell his parents that something was wrong and to not come. So he told them, he wrote this story about how his uncle was doing well, he was working, but the parents knew that the uncle had died. Mm. So it was just mild hints that people were sending Mm. to others to prompt them to not come, you know? And so you see so many levels of creativity. Um, my grandmother had this one friend who used to be, they were all in prison together in in Bernal. And so they had this strange, they came up with this strange knocking language. If they knock three times, it means something. If they knock twice and then one this way, it means something. And it was funny because these people were playing bingo 
and playing bingo, they would use that secret knocking no language way. to prompt each other um, as to certain things. Um, you know, it's crazy seeing what, how people yeah. overcome through their barriers. You know, you put you, you tell someone to yeah. you can't speak anymore. In one of our episodes, and you she'll spoke, find another way to speak. <laughs> I don't know if you listened to our episode on Harsnet, and but yes, that was yeah. what that was about. You know, they overcame their silence and they created yeah. a language. So. Uh, so there's like something to be proud about too through yeah. like that experience of theirs. Another one of her friends worked in the laundromat of the prison, and she needed to transport messages from one prisoner to the other. So she would quickly hand sew them into wow. the clothing that they would, and she became a master seamstress sure. in the United States after. But she would quickly fast hand sew the message in Armenian in the inside of whatever she was washing and transporting it out so yeah you talk about secret prison um, uh, badass grandmas <laughs> people learn to persevere even in the worst of spaces you know that's that says a lot about the Armenian spirit okay Nada what I wanted to ask is you know what's it like moving forward what can we do from this point on to kind of not just change the culture that's around it, but kind of also, not, and not just being educated on it, what are the steps that we need to do to kind of change this from moving forward in not just Haistan, but here in, here in and make the, the diaspora? And make the most of this experience and, you know, information. I mean, keep your eyes open. If that, you know, you have a, a high Astansi friend, it might be a lot more complicated than just them being a high Astansi. Right. Um, if, if you have a baby, I mean, this goes for everyone. Everyone has a mm. very, us being Armenians, we have a very, very um, complex and multi layered and, uh, you know, distinct background. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's all of us. That's not just one person. But people are the way they are because they're a product of their raising. Um, and I, I think if we were to be a little bit more cognizant about where people come from, we would understand a lot more about how they act and what we do. Um, and also, it's I, I do think our community sometimes refrains from having the difficult conversations. Mm-hmm. We kind of go into the ebb and flow of certain things, and we learn to do things a specific way. Um, uh, this We talk a lot about genocide recognition and what the genocide did, but there's a lot of very complex uh, very difficult uh, experiences in history that that existed post genocide that shaped our people a lot yeah um sometimes we become very insular in the organizations that we work in in the people that we are it becomes a bubble and we refuse to let people in and that's why i think the real value of being an akbar to me came from is is that bubble was kind of burst. From yeah, you're in multiple bubbles, right? It, it, it's, or, or there's no yeah, bubble. Yeah, the, the bubble is is it's just it's it's like that piece of the the <laughs> the bubble where the the soap kind of combines and it becomes this like very like translucent thing. Yes, it's a weird weird analogy. I know what you mean though. <laughs> but but you know it's um, we become insular and become part of our bubbles. Our friends become the same kind of people that we are, and we don't learn to. Um, work with other people and see other people and understand other people. This is where communi- like community issues arise from. This is when organizational issues come from. We refuse to see other people. Um, I think living in Glendale has, has been um, kind of, again, a microcosm of all of these different experiences. Um, mm-hmm. When I was growing up in, um, in elementary school, I was a first-hand witness to uh, the mass migrations of um, Hayastansis that yeah. moved to um, to L.A. at the time. And I remember um, we were talking about this with my friends a couple of days ago. Um, I remember growing up in maybe first, second, third grade, almost every single month there would be 10 or 15 new kids from Armenia who would show up and they would use us, the people who were kind of used to it, they would use us as translators yeah. and people to kind of uh, bring like, these people in and, and show them the ropes right, in yeah. America. That that was such. I was I was a kid. It was maybe like five, six, seven years old. But that was such a learning experience for me yeah. to understand how people um, assimilate, how people become American, how people right. learn to blend their identity. Yeah, and I. 
Uh, yeah. And who knows? I'm sure there might have been some people in the 1940s in Armenia doing the same thing. They were the kid there in that were. class that were helping these Akbars come in and get them accommodated <laughs> and acclimated to the new world that they're yeah. living in. But I, I really see our Akbar community, you guys, uh, all of you, um, as like maybe a potential bridge to create this connection uh, to help uh, make repatriation a more smooth and easy process. And uh, and then if we can learn more about this, we can a- avoid something like this again. Yeah. Um, but Nared, this was awesome. Thank you so much for yeah, sharing with us. Yeah, this was fun. Thank and you. And we'll make sure to share all those links uh, when we yeah. can. Yeah. And, uh, and thank you again. Of course. Yeah, it's been a huge eye-opener. <laughs> You are listening to Haidu Talks, the official podcast of the AYF West. I'm Haig Minasyan. And I'm Haru Bird. And we're just a couple of Armenians talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world.